I think uh, down the road we'd be able to answer if we had the data. Uh, but right now, as we're accumulating different aspects of the data, you know, we're putting together puzzle pieces, and the puzzle is getting more and more complete. So right now, it looks pretty hopeful. The data, at least, is not <laughs> horribly contradicting itself, you know. But if we're in a scenario where, you know, let's say the geological data opposes what we see on the hull, underneath the concretion, then we have a problem. But right now, the road's coming together very nicely. Let me tell you, we, we technically, we had a group approach us about a movie. A big movie on the gold coin, the love story and everything. But they need one component. What happened in those final minutes of the voyage? And we can't tell them. We can't complete our exhibits for the museum unless we know why she didn't come home. And so if we don't ultimately solve it, which I think we will, I think we'll have good strong clues to say, it, this is what happened, we're just not sure if it happened 10 minutes after or two hours after. Some think they were sitting out there waiting on the change of tide, weather front moved through, the water got rough. And when they took on the water, it occurred then. Others suspect it occurred, and they opened the hatch signal with the blue light, and the wave from one of the uh, boats, the USS Canandaigua, may have swamped her. Others theorize that maybe something hit the submarine somewhere, something uh, broke. There are many different theories on it. Uh, I think there's even a theory that she was anchored out there. But I'm confident that, that what will happen here is we'll pick up the pieces. For instance, eliminate or include the front eye piece. Uh, decide it was being bilged or it wasn't being bilged, the crew compartment. Then are we in the flood compartments? Uh, is there the remnants of an anchor rope or cable on the outside underneath that concretion? That's something we won't know till they take the concretion off. So we've got some distance to go, but I'm gonna tell you, the big picture is the final answer too. And the big picture uh, says that we got to bring all of the talent and all of the disciplines together to solve this story. I think it's premature that you know everybody out there have their theories, and I think we should. We have the privilege, you know, of looking at the submarine itself and the data, so we should probably hold uh, our opinion until we've had a chance to study it. That one secret is just one of many the submarine has clung to over the last eight years. Much of that was the result of what had happened as he sat on the floor of the Atlantic all those years. Concretion is a collection of organisms that attach to the substructure. They're referred to as barnacles, and they are a huge environmental concern for any company that does business on the seas. The buildup on the Hulney is extreme, but every ship fights the same battle. Might the science here at the Institute have some solutions to keep boats clear of barnacles? So there are some faculty members in materials science and engineering that are working on a type of polymer coating that would inhibit the marine organisms from growing so that they can be used to monitor a watershed for a long period of time without having to go out there every week and clean off the, the um, probes. And if I'm a boat manufacturer, I'm looking at that going, this would be a pretty nice yeah, little business. Yeah, if you here. can figure out how to keep stuff from growing on the hull of a boat. Um, I've got a better boat than the guy next door to me. you got a better boat than the guy next door to you. Now, if you can keep it off a big boat, like one of the... Maybe a transcontinental shipper or something. Transcontinental shipper. That translates to fuel dollars. So a part of what we do here is we integrate the disciplines, we look at complex problems, and then we figure out how to solve those uh, by rethinking and maybe uh, in a, a restorative way, redoing the way we've traditionally built. The work here between public and private entities, between scientists across a broad spectrum of disciplines, might one day transform a small part of the low country that was left in ruins when the Navy left town. Clemson's Restoration Institute is one of the largest tenants in a development that is hoping to restore many of the brownfield buildings here. The plan is to reclaim much of the old Navy Yard in ways that are at the forefront of environmental science. You know, our intent would be to really reconfigure the way we think about a lot of restoration types of projects. Uh, the architecture component is one and obviously uh, a reason to locate in Charleston. 
Uh, but there are many other aspects of restoration as well. When you start thinking of the natural world and how to restore damaged areas in the natural world, our project here happens to be on a brownfield. Every single pit, bit of the project is located on a brownfield site. So it gives us an opportunity to, to use nature to actually clean up a site that was tarnished by a presence of man. The complexity of trying to conserve the Hunley and started thinking about where we could take this. I went pretty far, but I didn't get to the Restoration Institute. Eight years ago, even the Hunley's most ardent supporters didn't envision a project that has literally taken on a life of its own. Science that might one day be spun out of the Institute will likely long outlast the people who are here today. Scientists still years away from completing the Hunley's true conservation. Looking at different aspects of the submarine, I'm constantly fascinated by the idea that somebody had to invent this. It's every part of it, whether it's uh, a river pattern or an interior uh, ballast pump, it had to be invented specifically for this submarine. And the other aspect that really strikes me is there's nothing in the structure that indicates that this was a submarine put together in a hurry and implemented quickly because there was a dire need. Everything is so complete, uh, so meticulously uh, executed. It's a real puzzle. I think everybody who's been associated with the Hunley has come away with that um, thought. It is really continually surprised. Like, continually look at this. surprised the way they engineered redundancy into things, the way they did things. It continually surprises us. The future and final resting place of the Hunley is still not known. The hope that it will be on display in our own museum as soon as 2013. By then, the Restoration Institute hopes to be an international hub of emerging science. And the Hunley's backers hope she'll be shown to hundreds of thousands of visitors every year. But we will go more for the, what we call virtual reality. Uh, it uh, will be an exhibit where you literally think through their brains and look through their eyes at the world they were in and you will understand why they would go out on that submarine and engage in that type of risk. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna have science components like the challenge of salts, how do salts get in metal, how do they get out in interactive exhibits because to tell the Hunley story, we found you got to have science. You got to have science of conservation, you got to have the science of archeology, span those coming together to describe the blueprint in time so we can tell that story. And we want the public to understand how we got to that story because if they understand that, they also will support missions such as what has occurred here with this. There are no public tours of the Hunley during the week. That's so the scientists there can work uninterrupted throughout the day. But you can see the sub almost any weekend. We have information about those tours on our website at myetv.org, as well as a host of other useful links. This programming note now, we're less than three weeks away from the Democratic National Convention in Denver. The big picture will be there with nightly updates right here on ETV. We'll also be live each morning at 9 with a special edition of the big picture on the radio. After Labor Day, it's back out on the road. We travel to Minnesota to spend a week with the Republicans. Same coverage there. TV every night, radio in the morning. That's all the time we have for now. Make sure to be with us next week when we talk politics and explore the popularity of online schools. They're called virtual schools. Are they good for education? For now, I'm Mark Quinn. Thanks for watching The Big Picture.